You have John Shee to thank for the handout at the back of the room. Um, and uh, you knew it was too colorful for me to have done it, right? Um, he uh, assembled this using a variety of resources, and I was very impressed with it. He sent me about three versions of it as he was developing it, and uh, very impressed with um, the work that he's done here. It would be very, very helpful to you. It actually, uh, quite providentially, in fact, touches on several matters that were already in our notes for this evening. So I'm thankful that you've got that ref reference and resource in front of you, because tonight we're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 15, and we are going to be um, introducing the last kings of the northern kingdom. And we're not really going to spend any time on Hosea tonight. That'll come in a couple of weeks. But as we're, we're thinking about these closing uh, days of the northern kingdom of Israel, I, I want to remind you of what we saw in a previous study, and that is that with the reign of Jeroboam II, Israel experiences an Indian summer of prosperity. Assyria is in the decline. Israel and other kingdoms in the ancient Near East are able to experience some economic and political revival. They're able to push back their borders, strengthen their military. The economy is doing well in those nations. It's a very exciting time to be a citizen in the northern kingdom. And yet at that time, as you'll notice on this handout that's been prepared for you, they are 31 years away from collapse. They are 30 years away from destruction by the Assyrian Empire and the deportation of all their people. Now, I've been encouraging you to memorize the kings of the northern and southern kingdoms, not because it's uh, necessary for you to do so, but simply because it'll be helpful for you in studying this period if you have some acquaintance with who these individuals are. I, I want to just kind of draw out the kings. I'm just focusing on the northern kingdom tonight. We'll look at the southern kingdom next week. But the first king of the northern kingdom was Jeroboam, and then he was followed by Nadab, Baasha, and now that you've got a list, you can check me if I make any mistakes, uh, Elah, and then Zimri. And then we have perhaps the first true dynasty, the first uh, multi-generational family to control the throne. Omri, followed by his son Ahab, followed by his son Ahaziah, followed by his son Jehoram. At this point, God raises up Jehu to judge the family of Omri and specifically the house of Ahab. And this leads us into the second major dynasty of the northern kingdom. And this would be Jehu, who was followed by his son uh, Jehoahaz, who was followed by his son, who was that? No, not Jeroboam, Jehoash. You remember, this is, the, this is where it, everything gets complicated. If you remember, actually, I guess I should say this is where it gets complicated for most people. But, but this is where it gets complicated because what's another spelling for Jehoash? Do you remember? Joash. And we also have a southern king named Joash. But we use Jehoash sometimes to keep these separate, even though the Bible doesn't always make that distinction. So Jehoash. Then I heard somebody say Jeroboam. And here we have to make this distinction. This is Jeroboam the second even though he is not familiarly related to the original Jeroboam. We just use the second in order to kind of keep things straight in our minds. Then we have Zechariah. This is the last descendant of Jehu to sit on the throne, and we're going to talk about him tonight. Now, after that, we have a, a series of rulers whose reigns overlap and whose administrations are largely unremarkable. All right? Uh, Shalom, Menachem, Pekahiah, and then if that weren't weird enough, Pekah, and then Hosea. Now people ask, how do you keep straight Pekahiah and Pekah? Well, long, L comes before S. Long comes before short. That's how I do it anyway, right? Pekahiah and then Pekah. Eventually, when you've got these names memorized, you're going to just be able to rattle off this list. But for now, finding little devices like that to help you remember. Ahaziah comes after Ahab. Jehoram comes after Jehoshaphat. You remember the inversion there with the northern and southern kingdoms. Things of that nature can sometimes be helpful. Zechariah starts with a Z. He's the last of the family of Jehu to reign. Z is the last letter in the alphabet. So find little things like that. We're going to cover these kings tonight. Zechariah, Shalom, Menachem, Pekahiah, Pekah, and then we'll just introduce Hosea. And, uh, and then leave that for a couple of weeks. Now, another way of thinking about this list is to notice how many changes there are in the families that control the throne of the northern kingdom. So in the southern kingdom, northern kingdom, you have 19 kings, right? In the southern kingdom, you only have 20 rulers, even though they last considerably longer, 
right? And the northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 or 721. There's always, you always have to put um, a, a one year, this kind of thing in there. 722 BC, the northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrians. And then 586, 585 BC, the southern kingdom is uh, finally destroyed. This, the Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple's burned. And the third wave of captives is taken by the Babylonians. So you can see the southern kingdom persists uh, almost 140 years longer than the northern kingdom. Only has one ruler uh, more, right? And that is because of the stability of the southern kingdom and the monarchy there. All of the rulers except one are of the family of David. And even the one is of the family of David by marriage. You'll remember that's Athaliah that we studied uh, some, uh, some weeks ago. So in the northern kingdom, another way to kind of follow this list is to put these together in family groupings. So you can say Jeroboam was followed by his son Nadab. Baasha then took the throne through a violent uprising. He was followed by his son Elah. Zimri took the throne for a whopping seven days and then was followed by Omri, who you remember uh, eventually solidifies, consolidates power in the northern kingdom. There's a period of civil war. I'm sorry? Yes, right, correct. Tibni is the other king who is during this time claiming the throne. We don't ever include him in the list, but that's good. It's really good, right? So he, during this time for a period of a few years, Omri and Tibni are kind of competing for who's going to take power. Omri has control of Samaria. That's normally why we re remember him there. He's followed by his son Ahab, then Ahaziah, and then Ahab's second son to reign, Jehoram. You'll remember Ahaziah dies without an heir, and so his brother takes the throne. Then the family of Jehu, right, which we already saw. Uh, I'm writing that wrong. Jehoash. Whoop. It's hard for me to talk and remember how to do this. There we go. All right. Jeroboam. Zechariah. Okay, now we're back on track. And then Shalom, Menachem. Menachem's son is Pekahiah. Pekahiah. Terrible name. Don't name any of your grandchildren that. It's terrible. All right. Pika. No offense to anybody who named their grandson. Okay. So what you can see here is that you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different families that control the throne during the history of that northern kingdom, right? So that tells you something about the instability, how many violent uprisings, how many assassinations, how many military coups. It's happening over and over and over again. Finally, God's going to put an end to it. And that's kind of what we're introducing tonight. So 2 Kings chapter 15 uh, is bookended, the beginning and the end of the chapter is bookended with histories of kings of Judah. But right in the middle, you have these five or so kings of the southern king, or of the northern kingdom, excuse me, uh, that, that are really unremarkable, right? I mean, we're going to mention a few things about them, but they're really unremarkable. These last six kings, including Hosea, that we won't focus on tonight, uh, really, each of them are evil, but otherwise they're not very notable in terms of the history of God's people. And, and this makes me think of what Solomon, or the preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 says, uh, in verse 12, Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. For it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear God. God. That's Ecclesiastes 8, 12, and 13. And that is really kind of a, a summary of 2 Kings 15. It's a summary of this period of the divided kingdom where you finally get down here to the end and it's just one king after another king after another king and you say, what did that king accomplish? Nothing much, right? I mean, he's just basically a placeholder until God finally brought judgment upon the nation. So you'll notice if your Bible puts headings in this chapter, you'll notice that there are just tons of headings here, a bunch of little short paragraphs because none of these kings individually are very remarkable and that's part of the point that we want to make tonight. Let's start by reading the first seven verses of 2 Kings 15. This is a king in Judah who is significant, although Kings gives him very little attention. His name is Azariah or Uzziah. 
Listen as I read. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. And Yahweh touched the king so that he was a leper to the day of his death, and he lived in a separate house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the household, governing the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham his son reigned in his place. Azariah was a good king overall, a very successful king, Chronicles tells us, but very little attention is paid to him in the king's account. And this is almost certainly because of what we've noted before, the difference in the theological purpose and the historical context of the writing of these two different narratives. Samuel King's is one narrative of the monarchy. Chronicles is a separate and parallel narrative. Samuel King's is written apparently during the time of the Babylonian exile, whereas Chronicles is written during the period of the return. And you can see that, by the way, at the conclusion of 2 Kings and at the conclusion of 2 Chronicles. Kings is interested in justifying the judgment of the covenant people. And so its record focuses more on the wickedness and the kings of the northern kingdom. Uzziah's reign was interesting and it was lengthy, but its content fits more appropriately in the text of Chronicles, which focuses attention on the Davidic covenant, the temple, and the promise of restoration. So Uzziah begins to reign. I'm going to call him Uzziah, even though the kings uh, typically refers to him as Azariah. Uzziah begins to reign at 16, and he has the second longest reign in the history of the southern kingdom, 52 years. But as you'll notice on this resource that John has prepared for you, those years overlap both with his father, Amaziah, and with his successor, his son, because once he's a leper, he cannot administer the kingdom anymore. He is placed into exile. So technically, he's still alive. Technically, he's still king. But functionally, his son takes over the throne. Now, this raises an issue that we do need to be aware of. We've mentioned it in passing before, but I need to give you a little more information at this point in our study, and that is that there are difficulties in the chronology of the divided kingdom. If you do the math and you add up the years each king reigned, you will qu quickly realize that you have far too many years there. The difficulty of harmonization, I believe, has been largely resolved by conservative scholars uh, really a, a generation or two ago. Uh, and, and I appreciate the fact that it's conservative scholars who have done the work necessary to harmonize this. Why do you suppose it would be conservative scholars? It's because they're the ones who actually take the biblical text seriously, the biblical data seriously. They're looking at this from the standpoint of faith, and they're saying there must be a way of reconciling this information, whereas liberally-minded scholars are going to just say there are errors. Right? They're, just, they're just mistakes. It, it, of course you don't expect the Bible to, to be right about everything, so they just kind of dismiss it, whereas conservative scholars have spent a lot of time on this. Now, I don't want to elaborate on the specifics of how we bring all of these numbers into harmony tonight. If you're curious about it, I can give you some recommended resources. But suffice it to say that the difficulties are resolved primarily by recognizing a couple of things. One is the fact that the kings of Israel and Judah kept time by two different calendars. And you may say, well, that's really weird and that seems really uh, foolish, but, but actually every business does that. They have a calendar year and they have a fiscal year, and the two are not normally the same. Uh, it's, it's a fairly common thing, not only in the modern world, but certainly in the ancient world. And so sometimes uh, one calendar is being referred to, and by putting the, the data together, you can begin to see uh, those patterns developing in the various narratives. More importantly is this issue of co-regencies that we just referenced. Many of the kings have their reigns as designated overlapping with other rulers, either their fathers or their sons. And Uzziah is a good example of this. His reign began during the time of his father Amaziah, uh, probably, uh, his father Amaziah, probably during the time that he was uh, taken captive 
by the northern kingdom. You remember uh, the, the Jehoash comes down and he takes Amaziah captive and he sacks the city of Jerusalem. Uh, many scholars believe this is probably the time that Uzziah actually takes the throne. And it overlaps many years at the other end since during that time Uzziah toward the end of his reign was a leper. And we don't know how many years he was in exile, but he is obviously not able to function as the leader of the nation. Now, I want you to hold your place here in 2 Kings 15. This is the only time we're going to do this tonight. I want you to turn over to 2 Chronicles 26 because there is some additional information here that you need to have. Kings mentions that the Lord touched Azariah, Uzziah, and he became a leper, but he doesn't tell you why. Chronicles does give us that information. So it's 2 Chronicles chapter 26. While you're turning over there, one of the other things that Chronicles tells us is that Uzziah was instructed in the way of the Lord by a prophet named Zechariah. Now, there are quite a few Zechariahs at this point in your head. A couple of kings, Zechariah, several prophets that are named Zechariah. This is none of the above. This is an otherwise unattested prophet. It is not the prophet uh, who wrote a book in the Minor Prophets. And so this Zechariah teaches Uzziah about the way of the Lord. And overall, Uzziah's reign is a very exemplary one. Uh, it's sad that the thing we really remember about Uzziah, if we remember anything, is just this episode of sin that led to his being condemned to, to live as a leper for the rest of his life. Overall, he is a very good and faithful king. He does not uh, address the false worship that was being offered at the high places, but sadly, that's kind of the besetting sin of the southern kingdom. The same way that in the northern kingdom, you have the golden calves of Jeroboam that are left untouched by every ruler. The, for the most part, the high place worship is left un, untouched by the kings of the southern kingdom with a couple of notable examples that we will come to uh, before long. But, but overall, he does as well as almost any other king except for the major reforming kings, Hezekiah and Josiah. He tries to do what is right, and God blesses him. Uh, Chronicles talks about his success uh, militarily and in terms of uh, improving the, the fortifications of the southern kingdom. God blesses him uh, because he is faithful. But that brings us to his sin. So notice 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 16. It says, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to Yahweh his God and entered the temple of Yahweh to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests of Yahweh who were men of valor, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to Yahweh, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from Yahweh your God. Then Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of Yahweh by the altar of incense. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out because Yahweh had struck him. And King Uzziah became a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of Yahweh. And Jotham his son was over the king's household, governing the people of the land. And this is why we're talking about co-regencies, is because this is where the biblical text becomes transparent about it. It's saying, see here, Uzziah is still king, and he is still alive, but he is not functioning as king. Jotham, his son, is, is functioning as king. And this is part of the reason Uzziah has a very lengthy reign. Uh, the leprosy was not fatal, obviously. He still lives to be a relatively old man. Uh, but for however many years this was, uh, he was an outcast. He was not allowed to go to the temple to worship. He was not allowed to visit Jerusalem to administer the affairs of the kingdom. He was not allowed to live at, at home with his family. He was essentially an outcast until the day of his death. Now, why does Uzziah do this? It's because his success, the blessings that God has given him, lead to pride in his life. And isn't that a cautionary tale for us, right? Can the, can the goodness of God actually be used by the adversary to trip up our sinful hearts? Absolutely. Uh, the adversary doesn't care whether you are healthy, wealthy, and wise. He just wants you to trust in the fact that you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. He wants you to take credit for the fact that you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. Uh, he, you know, he, he, he will use disaster, as in the case of Job, or he will use prosperity, as in the case of Uzziah, to try to exploit uh, the saints of God. 
In the Mosaic economy, the roles of prophet, priest, and king, while closely related and cooperative, were kept nevertheless separate. The king could participate and even lead in national terms or services of worship, but he could not presume to personally administer sacrifices and incense. In other words, he was not to intrude upon the peculiar responsibilities and privileges of the Aaronic priesthood. And when he does so, as in the case of King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13, or as in the case of Uzziah here in 2 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 26, when he does so, God brings judgment upon him. So Uzziah goes into the temple. He presumes to burn incense in the holy place before Yahweh. That was a priestly function. It was a uniquely priestly function. And there are 80 priests, plus the chief priest, the high priest, who stand up to him, men of valor. And that would take a lot of courage to stand up to this king. But they go in and they confront him and they say, you get out of here. You have done wrong. This is sin. You are not supposed to be doing this. And, and it is when Uzziah becomes angry that the leprosy appears. And, and I, I don't want to downplay the seriousness of the transgression of offering the incense in the holy place. That's obviously wrong. That's the original, well, I guess the pride is the original sin, right? But that's the original instance of sin that the priests are confronting. But it seems like that God actually strikes him when he becomes angry in response to their reproof. And here's another cautionary tale, right? When we are confronted in our sin, how do we respond? Do we respond out of the anger that is the offspring of pride, or do we respond with the humility of the psalmist that says, let the righteous strike me, it will be a kindness. I wonder, right, if Uzziah had humbled himself, if he had been convicted and contrite at that point and said, you know something, you're right, and I am sorry, I've sinned against God, would he have left the, temper to, to the temple not as a leper, right, but still as king? I, well, I guess we'll never know. But uh, he, is, he is struck down with leprosy, and that becomes a tangible and physical sign of the spiritual uncleanness that Uzziah had committed in his presumption. Again, it's not fatal, but it is a lifelong consequence of that sin. Uh, Uzziah's heart was lifted up with pride because of his success. And we need to remember that blessing should always humble us, not make us haughty. Another point that we need to see with regard to Uzziah is that God takes authority in worship seriously. I mean, this is part of the regulative principle of worship, right? This is why we say God takes his worship seriously. He guards worship. And when he appoints that certain things are to be done in certain ways or by certain people, as in this case, then, then he means that. And even when a priest would transgress those rules, as we saw in the case of Nadab and Abihu back in Leviticus chapter 10, God brings very severe consequences. Well, let's go back now to 2 Kings chapter 15, and we're going to clip very quickly through uh, about five different kings here uh, for just a few minutes. Zechariah, Zechariah, the final descendant of Jehu to control the throne of the northern kingdom. All of these five kings will be kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. Don't let that confuse you. Verse 8 of 2 Kings 15. In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reigned over Israel in Samaria six months. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck him down at Ablim and put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. This was the promise of Yahweh that he gave to Jehu. Your son shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. We had to give you all the rest of that history of Zechariah, which is altogether unremarkable and unsurprising, just to be able to get to verse 12, because verse 12 is the point. God made a promise, and he kept it. And when that promise was fulfilled, Jehu's family was removed from the throne. God made a promise to Jehu that to the fourth generation, your sons will sit on the throne, and they did. And as soon as they had, it, that was it, right? So it was. This is exactly why Zechariah was able to control the throne. And how long does he reign? Six months. Six months, that's all. He is the fourth descendant, just as God promised, 
but the end was drawing near, not only for this promise to Jehu, but for the northern kingdom as well. He continued in the sins of Jeroboam like all of his predecessors on the throne. He was murdered by Shalom in a coup like many of his predecessors, not in his family obviously, but uh, as his great-grandfather had done uh, to the family of Ahab. And what I want you to see is that the only thing that had spared the last four kings from the same fate was God's promise. His promise will always prove true, no matter how impossible or unlikely it should seem. And this is why I wanted to draw this out this way, is so that you can see this kingdom is in continual turmoil. Again, Ahab's family looks more impressive than it is. His son Ahaziah dies before he can even produce an heir. And then his brother comes to power for a relatively brief period of time. It's not as though this is a long dynasty. Jehu's family is the only one that holds the throne for any considerable period of time, and the only reason they hold it is because God promised that he would. That's it. The only thing that kept the family of Jehu from losing the throne to some violent coup, as Zechariah did, is the fact that God keeps his promises. His word will prove true, and do not ever doubt that. Even toward the undeserving God shows kindness and maintains blessings because he is truthful and good even when we are not. But you do need to see that it is only the hand of God that restrained evil and catastrophe in that family. The only thing that preserved order, the only thing that kept this family from self-destruction is the fact that God kept his hand upon them until he didn't. And when that restraining grace was removed then Zechariah did not last even one year. And what I want you to remember is that this is, this is the best period of the northern kingdom, economically, militarily, politically, in terms of stability, in terms of internal peace, best period of the northern kingdom. And yet, it is not a good economy or a stable government or relative peace that is our security. These things are the gifts of God's kindness. It is never an indication that we are secure. Our security is in the Lord alone. And that's the overwhelming lesson you need to see from this last descendant of Jehu and his brief time in power. Now, I want to put Shalom, Menachem, Pekahiah, and Pekah all together and just kind of look at them very briefly. So let me begin reading uh, in verse 13. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah, and he reigned one month in Samaria. Then Menachem, the son of Gadi, came up from Tirzah and came to Samaria, and he struck down Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria, and put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Shalom and the conspiracy that he made, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. At the at that time, Menachem sacked Tifsa and all who were in it and its territory from Tirzah on because they did not open it to him. Therefore, he sacked it and he ripped open all the women in it who were pregnant. Just as an aside, this is something that's found in the prophetic literature. It is an evil, it is a war crime that is denounced by God's prophets addressing the foreign nations around Israel. There should be a categorical difference between the way that God's people, in this case Israel and Judah, wage war and the way that all of their neighbors wage war. But what you're seeing is that decline that, that the kings of Israel are indistinguishable from the heathen around them, right? Shalom holds power for one month and then the next guy comes along and kills him. And the next guy that kills him is a, is a I mean, he's a barbarian. Right? He's not just a murderer. He's not just an assassin. He's, he's someone who would commit war crimes against pregnant women as a, as a means of demonstrating his power against a city that would not bow the knee. Right? Menachem is a contemptible individual. Verse 17. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menachem, the son of Gadi, began to reign over Israel, and he reigned ten years in Samaria. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He did not depart all his days from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Pul, the, son, the, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menachem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver that he might help him to confirm his hold on the royal power. Menachem exacted the money from Israel, that is, from all the wealthy men, 50 shekels of silver from every man to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. 
Now the rest of the deeds of Menachem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Menachem slept with his fathers, and Pekahiah his son reigned in his place. Other kings, both of the north and of the south, have paid off powers that came against them, like Assyria. Menachem does something more than that, though, unless I'm misreading the text. The text seems to suggest that he doesn't just give uh, Pul, the king of Assyria, a bribe in order to say, don't destroy me. He actually gives him a bribe in order to help secure his, his control. It's as if he, he buys the blessing of the Assyrians. He's not just paying them off, as other kings have done. He's buying the blessing. He's buying the approval. So not only is Menachem a war criminal, right? He's also the kind of traitor that would enter into alliances with the enemies of the people of God in order to secure his own position, right? When, well, see, I'm anticipating my application, but when God hands a nation over for judgment, what do you expect to see? Verse 23. In the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menachem, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned two years. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. And Pekah, the son of Remaliah, his captain, conspired against him with 50 men of the people of Gilead and struck him down in Samaria in the citadel of the king's house with Argob and Aria. He put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. It's like you get up every day and you turn on the news to find out who's president, right? I mean, it's like there's no telling. I mean, a month, six months, two years, I mean, it, it's, there's, there's no way of predicting it. This coup involves 51 people. It's not like that's an impressive number, but it doesn't take an impressive number because there's absolutely no stability. There's absolutely no security. There's nothing to, to attach your anchor to in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is headed down the whirlpool, and they are almost to the bottom. It is, it is past time for the righteous to get out <laughs> because this is a nation clearly under judgment. Verse 27, in the 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 20 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Aijon, abel beth Maacah, Genoa, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried the people captive to Assyria. Then Hoshea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and struck him down and put him to death and reigned in his place in the twentieth year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Now the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And here again is almost certainly a place where we've got overlapping reigns, uh, and yet it's difficult for us to know definitively at what point one reign begins and, and the other ends. Pekah holds power relatively speaking, for a longer period of time, 20 years. That's, that's, a, that's a fairly significant reign, especially at this period. And yet, what is his reign characterized by? Continued instability, defeat. In fact, this is where the Assyrians show up for the first time and say, we're going to take people away. We're going to deport your citizens, make them captives, send them into exile. And this is only a foreshadowing of what is to come. It is because of the weakening of the northern kingdom and the administration of Pekah but because of the Assyrian incursion that Hosea is able to take control, and he will be the last leader of the northern kingdom to do so. This is what a nation looks like when it has been handed over for judgment. Restraints have been removed. Political instability has ensued. We see it in other ancient kingdoms. For instance, we see this in Rome. And we should, not, we should be mindful of the possibility in our own day. God had warned the people again and again by his prophets, and they refused to listen. They hardened their hearts. They stopped their ears. They gritted their teeth. And now he would allow them to self-destruct by giving them their own way, by giving them over to their own will. I mean, it's, it is amazing to me, and I, I hope, you know, this is, a, this is a quick survey, but I hope that the speed of it gives you a sense of how remarkable this is. You have this long period of stability and prosperity. And then Zechariah comes to the throne, and it's like the Lord flips the switch and says, time's up. And it's just racing at breakneck speed downhill from there until the nation is finally destroyed. That's how quickly things can change 
when God says to a nation, thy will be done? Are we heeding the word and warnings of God as individuals, in our families, in this church, in the broader visible church? When warnings go unheeded, eventually the fruit of rebellion and disobedience will ripen. And surely you have seen this. Maybe in your life, maybe in your family, maybe in other churches, where when warnings go unheeded, when problems go unaddressed, when sin is not disciplined, when leaders do not humble themselves before the Lord, there, there comes a tipping point. And after, in the aftermath, as you're lying, you know, walking amid the smoking ruins, you're able to say, in retrospect, we should have seen this coming. <laughs> Right? We should have seen this coming. It's been coming for a long time. But we finally hit that point where critical mass has been achieved. And now there's no stopping it. You're going to see this in the southern kingdom, by the way, as well, in the reign of Manasseh. That, that's the turning point for the nation. God says to Judah, because of Manasseh's reign, there is no going back. The nation cannot be saved. Individuals can be saved. You can be saved by turning to the Lord. But the nation will not be spared. I'm going to wipe Jerusalem the way that the, a man wipes a dish. And that's the point that we're at with regard to Israel. Dale Ralph Davis, in his commentary on this passage, has this to say, quote, It was that way in the last days of Israel. Clear signals of God's coming judgment, but no eyes to see them, no ears to hear them. I refer my readers again to Amos 4, 6 through 12, where Yahweh sent preliminary and limited judgments on Israel to awaken her and lead her to repentance. But the signals were ignored. And so disaster would come. We have spoken of this before in relation to nations. The same holds for the church. If a church denomination equivocates and refuses to affirm biblical moral standards, for instance, regarding homosexuality, is this not a sign that God is giving over his own professing people to follow their own authority? If a church fails or refuses to discipline ministers who deny Apostles' Creed-level doctrines but allows them to serve in all their unbelief, is this not a signal that God has already written Ichabod over that communion? Remember Ichabod, right? In 1 Samuel 4, the glory has departed Israel. Now, we cannot always know definitively at what point uh, or, or you know, at, at the particular time that that point has been reached. Now, I'm not suggesting that we ought to read the tea leaves of providence or pronounce judgment upon churches or denominations or nations or certainly on our families. But you and I need to see this point, that there is a point where the fruit of rebellion, of disobedience is going to ripen, where the harvest is going to come to the point of maturity and God is going to send the reapers into the field. And this is why it is important in our, in our lives as disciples, in our marriages with our spouses, with our children as parents and grandparents, in our churches as brethren in Christ, and in every other sphere of relationship. You keep short accounts. You do not allow sin to accumulate. You do not allow problems to, to develop because when you do so, eventually this is where you can end up. You can reach that point where we thought everything was going fine. And right up until Zechariah takes the throne, everything was going fine. But as soon as Zechariah takes the throne, it's practically over. 30 years. 30 years. And there is no longer a nation. We go from the Indian summer of prosperity to no more Israel in 30 years. You think our nation has changed a lot in the last 30 years? It has. But can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? They descend into unchecked chaos. And we've seen this happen. And it can happen. In our lives, in our families, in a congregation, do not take for granted the word of God, the promises of God, the warnings of God, right? The grace of God that restrains us from the self-destruction we would otherwise plunge into. The last king and the last unit in this chapter begins in verse 32. And this takes us back to the southern kingdom of Judah. So again, we have, we have a, a king of Judah at the beginning of the chapter, a king of Judah at the end of the chapter, and then these five kings in the middle of the chapter of Israel. But we come back to Judah and we come to Jotham. Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the son who becomes king before his time, as it were, because of the sin and the sickness of his father. Notice in verse 32. 
In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok, and he did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of Yahweh. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days, Yahweh began to send Reason, the, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father, and Ahaz his son reigned in his place. Jotham definitely had a time of co-regency, but his administration is marked by good. Like his father, with the exception of the incident in the temple, he was a good king. He reigned 16 years. He did what was right in the sight of Yahweh, even though those high places were still not addressed. Now, Chronicles tells us more about his successes, although even there the history is very brief. It's in 2 Chronicles 27 if you want to read that. I'm not going to take the time tonight. I do want to make a couple of applications or observations and applications about Jotham. Uh, first of all, I, I want you to notice that he's a good king, and yet he is a king whose administration is marked with some trouble. God sends the Syrians and the northern kingdom, the Israelites, against Judah during this time. Not every trial like that is evidence that the king is unfaithful. And you and I need to realize that. Be because there's a tendency, maybe in our marriage, maybe in our, in our family, maybe in our congregations, that if there's trouble, if there's problems, that maybe we immediately look for a scapegoat. We want to point the finger and say that there must be, there must be something wrong that you've done. Well, wait, that, that may be the case. It may be a trumpet judgment. It may be a warning from the Lord saying, hey, you need to be chastised a little bit. You need to be convicted and, and, and contrite before the Lord. But, but this incursion by the Syrians and the Israelites was not because of Jotham's unfaithfulness. Uh, this, this is the kind of point that, that pushes back against this health and wealth prosperity heresy that says if you serve the Lord faithfully, then everything's going to go well. Which, there's no promise like that in Scripture. And you see in the experience of someone like Jotham, uh, quite the contrary. Sometimes God's people will still suffer and be tested and will go through fire for their sanctification, for their good, and for God's glory. But the main point that I want to, to draw your attention to tonight before we close with regard to Jotham is that if I were going to ask you, name three good kings of Judah during the period of the divided kingdom. I dare say, and I could be wrong, but I dare say I don't think anyone would list Jotham. I just don't think you would. You might put Asa on that. You probably would put Jehoshaphat. You almost certainly would put Hezekiah and Josiah, right? The best kings of the divided kingdom. But I don't know that anybody would remember Jotham. In fact, I don't know that anybody remembers Jotham most of the time. Uh, he's, he's one of those kings that if you haven't memorized the kings and if you're not like, regularly reviewing the kings, uh, if I haven't been reviewing the kings for a little while and I, I sketch out all the kings, Jotham's one of the ones that you could just jump right over. You say, wait, wait, that's a, oh, Jotham, right, I forgot. Well, that, that's sad because, I mean, as far as we know, Jotham is, is saved. He's a, he's a righteous man. He's a servant of God. Not every servant of the Lord is an Elijah or a David or a Josiah. In fact, most faithful saints will be more like Jotham even though they will not necessarily be kings. Our lives, like his, may be largely unremarkable and not particularly memorable. We may not leave a wide or a bold mark on the world. We may simply serve the purpose of God in our generation. That phrase, by the way, comes from Acts 13. That's how Paul describes David's administration. I think that's just a beautiful way of, of describing it. And yet, if, if we were talking about David, wouldn't we want to say something more significant? We served the purpose of God. Well, sure, but I mean, he was also, I mean, like he was a valiant warrior and he was a, killed ten, tens of thousands of Philistines and, and was the sweet psalmist of Israel, was a mighty king. And we want to say all these big things. The most important thing to say about David is the same thing that you would say about Jotham. He served the purpose of God in his generation and he fell asleep. And that's the best you can do. Serve the purpose of God in your generation. Jotham was not a perfect man. But the fact that he is not remembered for great accomplishments does not mean that he was unimportant. 
He served God, not perfectly, but sincerely. And that's the most and the best that anyone can ever do. And I wonder if we believe that. I wonder if I believe that some days, because all of us tend to put on a pedestal people who accomplish great things. We, we, tend to, we tend to estimate people's importance in terms of the impact that they have on the greatest number of people. And so you would just look at some kings and say, well, that, that king's just more important. He got, he got more things done. You'd look at some warriors and you say, this is just more important than some other warriors because he was, he was involved in greater battles and, and greater victories. You look at some pastors. You look at some fathers and mothers. You look at some individual saints in the kingdom of God, and you say, well, some, some people are more important than others because, because they've really left their mark. But that's not the way that God judges or measures those kinds of things. Our salvation does not depend on great deeds in the name of Jesus Christ. It depends on the grace of Christ, which leads us simply to trust Him and cling to Him in life and in death. Our ambition in life should be like Count von Zinzendorf, even though adapted to our particular calling, he was quoted as saying that his ambition was to preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. Great. Calvin refused to have his grave marked. He wanted to be buried in such a way that nobody would be able to visit his grave because he didn't want that to be any, anything. He didn't want there to be a, a pilgrimage to, to see the grave of the great man. He was a great man, right? But he had the right attitude. May God grant each of us the grace and contentment to aspire the same. We may not remember Jotham, but God remembers Jotham. And praise God for that, because most of us are not as significant from a worldly standpoint as Jotham was. Well, I'm not ever going to be a king of a kingdom, right? But God remembers his faithful people. Well, in closing, where is Christ? It's what we've always tried to, to close with in this study of the divided kingdom. Where is Christ in this passage? Well, we've emphasized recently that much of this history in the divided kingdom demonstrates the need for Christ and the reality that no one can be Jesus except Jesus. And the truth is, I could say that every single week in every single chapter of First and Second Kings, and it, and it would still be true, right? It would, where is Christ? He's not here yet, and that's why we need him, right? So that's, that's always part of it. But we could say, in this case, that there is a connection with Christ in the experience of Uzziah that should not be overlooked. Uzziah was a good king, but he was only a king. And that is not true of Jesus. Uzziah could not be the true and perfect prophet, priest, and king. The anointed one, right? So in the Old Testament, who was anointed to office? Kings? priests, and on occasion, not always, prophets. I don't think it's a coincidence that those are the three offices that are anointed positions in the Old Testament. And how is Jesus titled? He is Messiah, Christ, the anointed one. He is the one upon whom God's spirit fully resides, empowering him to all three of these offices in one person. Only Jesus can occupy that role. What Isaiah attempted to do didn't work because it was not his right. It was not his privilege to enter into the holy place and act as priest in the presence of God. But Jesus can do that, and Jesus has done that because he is, in fact, our prophet, our priest, and our king. All right, observation. 